You are listening to Beyond the Wheel, a podcast about the people and ideas that drive the RV community forward. Looking to get out there and stay out there? Battleborn Batteries Lithium Ion Batteries are here to power your RV, marine, and off grid adventures. Designed as an easy drop in replacement for traditional lead acid batteries, these reliable solutions have two to three times the power, charge five times faster, are a fifth of the weight, and last 10 times longer. Offered in a variety of models in unique sizes and shapes, ranging from 50 amp hour to a robust 270 amp hour, and backed by a 10 year warranty. Battleborn batteries are built to fit your needs and power your experiences. On the road, on the water, and off the grid, reliable power is here. Check them out at BattlebornBatteries.com. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Driver's Edition here in October of 2024. Sean and I are joining you. We're both actually in Virginia, but we're still not in the same room together. But we're pretty close, pretty close. (laughs) It actually feels to me like... Uh, we just did a driver's edition. Sometimes it's kind of funny how time works. Sometimes it feels like, man, it feels like it's been forever since we've sat down, just the two of us talking and chatting with the audience. And sometimes uh, it goes by really quick. This this one, luckily to me, feels like it's been a short time in between. These are probably still, I love all of our guests, but these are probably still my favorite uh, episodes to record when it's just the two of us chatting about the industry and you know, kind of what's going on in our RV life's yeah, and I don't, I don't remember the last driver's edition. Kenny, so it doesn't seem that close to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I feel well. I don't know. I've been busy, but busy in a different way. I was going to say you've been ex- extremely busy with work, and I've been extremely busy with goofing off. So, <laughs> yeah, you had I'm a sure. cool. You had a cool trip to. Uh, through down route 66 or up route 66. I'm not even sure how to say that. Jeez, I wouldn't know either. I went from New Mexico to Illinois. So I'm going to say up because I was traveling slowly north as I traveled along. So we'll say up, up uh, route, route 66. And it was a very strange trip for me because I am not, Sabrina and I both are not I would say the traditional sightseers when we do RV travel. And I remember even calling you the first day of the trip or the second day of the trip. And I, I said to you, I was like, I'm really bad about this taking my time. I left New Mexico and, and wound up in Oklahoma the very first day. And I stopped along the way to sightsee and I still wound up driving like 500 miles that day. I just, uh, I'm just not, not good at it because for such a long period of time, Sabrina and I always had traveled in the RV for work and not so much for like vacation and leisure. So this was a totally different experience for me to have the RV and actually travel like a normal RVer for once. I put that up in quotes, normal RVer, but it it was a lot of fun. It was just Belle and I on this trip. And like I said, we left from New Mexico, went to Illinois and, you know, I just used Google maps. Uh, I bet you this would be a trip that would be perfect for something like adventure to, you know, plan out, all the little stops. But you know what I did? I, I I went to Google Maps and I typed in Route 66 roadside attractions and it did pop up with a, a bunch of them. And then I just had to filter out which ones I wanted to stop at. You know, the one thing about the way I traveled and because I've traveled so fast, I was getting to things when they were closed. I think Adventure Genie would have probably figured all that stuff out hours of operation and things like that so that when you when when i arrived to something it would have actually been open instead of me just winging it i guess yeah so i planned the trip but i was also partially winging it too because i didn't know where i was going to stop each night but i i loved it i i thought it was a great trip i did a you know i'm a fan of museums so i did a couple route 66 museums one in new mexico that was really good five five dollars too a really cheap museum and I did one in uh, Oklahoma. Yeah. The other one was a transportation museum in Oklahoma. And again, $5, 18 buildings. And I think 13 of them, 12 or 13 of them, you could actually go into and explore. The rest were kind of facades. And you could just pierce uh, through the windows and see what the, the building was. It was like a, the ones that you couldn't go in were like a barbershop or a post office or a bank. And then the other ones that you could go in just had a ton of collectibles and just a lot of history. And I really enjoyed, I just, I don't know. I just enjoy the museums a lot. 
one of the things I did at that Oklahoma, I, I text Sean right after I did it, or I might've called him even, or sent him photos. I slid down like a firehouse pole and it's just something that I was like, man, I just feel like I just fulfilled like a childhood dream to slide down <laughs> this firehouse pole. And I was like, man, that was worth my $5 right there just to slide down. <laughs> I And there's no limit how many times you do. So I slid down that pole like three times. <laughs> and I'm a, a pretty chatty person when I'm out in public and, and stuff like that. So I, I talk with the people kind of running the museums. And this person came over and she actually was the one that filmed me. She filmed me coming down the fire pole. And I talked to her for a little bit. Her father's fire engine was actually in the museum. The fire engine that he built was on display. It was the Elk City Fire Department. So it was really uh, cool to just chat with her. And the same thing with the museum that I did in New Mexico. I chatted with the two guys uh, that were in there, Jim and Ken. And I felt by talking with the people that were operating the museum, I got a lot more information than if I were just to kind of walk through the muse museum on, on my own, because everything's self-guided. You don't get a guide or anything like that. So I felt by talking with the people, I was getting more information than if I were just to browse through it. Both those museums, I feel like were well worth it. The New Mexico Museum, the Route 66 New Mexico Museum, you could probably do that museum. I did it in about an hour. I could have definitely taken a little bit more time. The Transportation Museum in Elk City, Oklahoma. I did that one in a little over three hours, and I could have probably taken more time on that one, but both of them were well worth it. And then, of course, you stop by, well, I did anyway, Cadillac Ranch. I thought that was pretty cool. The, the Blue Whale of Catoosa. I saw the world's largest concrete totem pole. I'm picking up T-shirts from a lot of the places that I visit. It was just a, a fun trip. A lot, anything that was outdoors, Bell could do with me. So like the blue whale, the totem pole, those things are great. They're very pet friendly. I'll also mention like everything that I saw along the way. I was able to find parking for my class A motor home, even with towing my Jeep behind it. And that's something I didn't really plan too much ahead of time. I would kind of just take a look at the satellite view of Google Maps and see and be like, all right, I think I could fit there. Like, I remember doing that, especially for the places that I wanted to eat, like Midpoint Cafe and Docks just off of 66. So there's a fun little, I mean, I don't know how much of a tip it is. It's probably kind of an obvious thing to do. But yeah, just take a look at Google Maps with a satellite view and you'll see, all right, where's their parking at? If they don't have parking, then I just kind of scan the area a little bit see if I can find a parking lot big enough that can hold my Class A motorhome and the Jeep. Even though we're only 28 feet long, the combination makes us pretty pretty big vehicle overall. So it's not it's not always easy to find parking. But yeah, everywhere I went, I found parking spaces. I even did like a little detour on this trip and I did the Superman Museum. And Sean had asked me what my favorite part of the Route 66 trip was earlier. And even though it's not part of the Route 66 travels, I, I man, I was just, I, I couldn't have been happier <laughs> in that Superman museum. I'm, I'm a big Superman fan. And I spent three hours in this museum and it's a small museum. And even when I was coming back out, the guy that was like operating that museum, he's like, he's like, you were in there for a minute. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm a, a big Superman fan and they just had different props. They had the cartoon cells in there they had a bunch of toys that i grew up with like superman toys they even had like the old like 1980s superman halloween costumes with the plastic mask and you'd sweat to death behind the mask i know because i had that mask i had that costume that they had hanging up there in the museum so i i was in there for three hours and i didn't want to leave i i, I kind of backtracked and backed up and let, said well let me walk this way and just see if i missed something and sure enough i did miss a couple things so yeah it, it was a it was a great trip. And I did some off-roading with the Jeep and got some more Jeep badge of honors. I know I'm talking a lot, Sean. <laughs> I, I just can't believe, Kenny, that you remember the people's names in the museum. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know what? I'm, uh, I'm hit or miss with that kind of stuff. I, I'm, I will say that Sabrina is better at remembering people's names when, they, uh, when we meet them. So I'm surprised, too. Yeah, I'm surprised, too. Well, well I'd help that. Jim and Ken, I mean, the one guy shares my name, so that's an easy one. And Jim's a pretty easy name, too. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I remember both of their names. I never, I didn't get the name of the person at the 
uh, Oklahoma Museum. Otherwise, I would tell you her name, too. So, yeah, and I'm not reading this from anything. <laughs> I'm just talking off. I mean, the only thing that I have in my notes here is that it says talk about my Route 66 experience. So all this is right off the top of my head. Yeah, but you're good. I feel like you're really good with names. No, I wouldn't remember that. No way. No I way. Don't know. I think we talk and chat often sean and and i'll say to you who was that person that we talked to like a couple years ago and a lot of times i feel like you remember <laughs> I, i'm usually looking it up oh, okay mm -hmm. You're, that's cheating i think <laughs> so the question kenny is would you recommend people do that oh do yeah absolutely yeah. yeah yeah it's a lot of fun it's uh you know in the class a gas motor home the roads just like anywhere else there are hit or miss sometimes there are stretches of Route 66 that were really nice, and there were some parts that needed to be repaired. I would say, though, the good thing is that, you know, when you're on Route 66, I feel like the maximum speed was 55 miles an hour. The other thing you've got to kind of be careful of is that it's not complete anymore. So there are times where you're going to run out of Route 66, and then you'll have to ha hop on I-40, or I think it was 44. So there are sections that are... Uh, broken up that will probably never be put back together. And then there were some sections on my drive that were flooded out that I would have to kind of work around as well. So, but yeah, absolutely do that trip. I, I, I had a blast. I went to uh, Uranus in Missouri and I just like chuckled the whole time I was there. And I went to the Uranus fudge factory that's there and picked up fudge and t-shirts and just giggled the whole time I was there. Cause I'm so, you know, just so childish. <laughs> It was a great trip. And for me, too, part of the, the, the great part of that trip for me was having Belle with me and taking pictures of Belle in front of the whale or in front of the Cadillac Ranch. I got to throw a big shout out to Battleborn Batteries. I don't think I could have done this trip without Battleborn Batteries, because like I said, not everything was pet friendly. And I was totally fine and comfortable with leaving Belle in the parking lot, running my air, you know, running my air conditioner from the Battleborn batteries and the Victron inverter while she was in there. And then I was using a, uh, the pet monitor, the pet waggle uh, monitor to make sure that everything was staying, you know, comfortable in there for her. She doesn't like being left alone, but at least I knew that she wasn't like hot or anything like that. Cause it, this was a couple of weeks ago and it was still, still warm out. I mean, even, even the time of this recording, Sean, I was just talking to a friend of mine that's uh, in Arizona out in Phoenix, and he said it's only hit 111 degrees today. It's 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 like the last week of September. It's still that hot. So, yeah, I feel like that battle form. It was expensive that install, but well, just well worth it for peace of mind that that Bell's okay in the RV. And without it, I wouldn't even be able to leave her alone, really. So I feel like this this trip wouldn't be able to do it without without that system that we installed. Yeah, definitely do the trip, though. Definitely do the trip. And then uh, we both went to Hershey, and we were both kind of shopping around for something new. Yeah. I know that Julie and I really fell in love with a, uh, a Winnebago, a, a small Winnebago, a 24-foot Winnebago. The name's escaping me right now, Kenny, but I know you know it. It's the Vita. The yeah. Vita, that's right, the Vita. <laughs> we both really like that Vita. It was nice. It also has a second name. It can be a Vita or it can be a Porta. Uh, why they do that, I, I'll, I mean, I do know, but it's a complicated reason of why they do it. And a lot of times it still doesn't make much sense to me. So, yeah, yeah, so we we really liked that one. And we liked it so much that we're going to rent a similar RV for um, going down to Disney in November uh, just to see if we could really stay in it for a few days and still be happy. So, <laughs> I, I mean, it was a good a good uh experience for us to to go to hershey and actually woodall's campground magazine put out an article that said um there were 2300 more people attended hershey this year than mm -hmm. last year i which, didn't feel yeah. i didn't feel it yeah. yeah i didn't feel it either i didn't think it was yeah i was surprised by that number i was there on a friday a saturday and sunday and Friday felt really slow to me. Uh, Saturday was the only day that felt busy to me. And then Sunday felt slow to me again. So I didn't feel as if it was any busier than, than the previous year. But it's good that it was. I just didn't notice it. 
it felt bigger to me this this year too. Uh, more vendors for sure. I mean, inside and outside, there were quite. I thought there were more vendors than there were in the past, which is kind of my favorite part is checking out the vendors. Uh, so yeah, I was happy with with Hershey this year, especially compared to last year. Yeah, it was a better show this year than last year. I did enjoy it more, and the vendors. Uh, I agree with you. You know, we talked to. See, now I won't remember his name, Sean, but maybe you will. The guy over at Cinderella, and he was showing us the uh, what? What would you call it? Incinerator for like the toilet? Yeah, the incinerator toilet. Yeah, and I thought that was a really cool idea. In fact, maybe we should try to get them on. So, I mean, the nice thing about it is. I mean, no black tank with this system. He was showing us how it all worked, how you maintained it. It seemed fairly easy to maintain. Uh, I just like the fact that you could put this in a smaller rig and no black tank and not have to worry ab about, uh, well, one, I guess would open up more space for a larger freshwater tank and a larger gray water tank. It, it seemed, how would I put it? it? It's not simple, I guess. But it, it seemed safe enough to me. Like, I know Sabrina said, well, how do you feel about having something burning in your RV? And I'm like, well, we already got a furnace that, you know, it's running off propane and has a flame and, and burns. Our RV refrigerator for a long time was... Water heater. So, yeah, it might have been the word incinerator that was giving her a weird vibe about it. But, yeah, I thought it was a really cool product. Yeah, and uh, you only have to empty it, I think he said, every 60 flushes. So that's pretty cool, too. I mean, that's that's a lot of flushes. Yeah. And when he showed us what you're emptying, I mean, you're you're literally just kind of emptying out ashes. Yeah, just ashes. Yeah, it's really nice. Almost cleaner than dumping a black tank. Way cleaner. Way, way, way cleaner. <laughs> yeah. The whole system seemed clean. So you put down some type of, oh, geez, was it paper? I guess it was some type of paper that would fit in there. Then you go through the whole flush. Like you said, 50, 60 flushes. Then when it's time to like empty it, you just have a little bit of ash. I, yeah, I thought it was really cool. You also found a, an RV that you guys liked, right? Yeah, but my memory's not going to be that great. So I know it's a Winnebago Access, and it's about 22 feet long. It's a single axle travel trailer, no slide. So we narrowed it down to two. One's a dual axle, and now we found this single axle. They're both... No, I'm sorry. One's a micro mini and one's is this new Axis. It's a brand new floor plan that they just released for the Hershey show. And we are leaning way towards the single axle for two reasons. One's it's, it's very light, so it'll be easy for us to, to tow. And two, it doesn't have a slide. And our plans for this travel trailer are to put it down in Mexico where it's going to sit for long periods of time. And we just think without having a slide, it's just one less thing for the salt. We're going, it's going to be right on the beach. So we're like, well, you know, it's one less thing for salt water and the salt air to try to, uh, to tear up. We're really leaning towards that floor plan. It's 22 feet. It's got a sofa. It's got a dinette. Uh, very important to me. The, the sofa faces a good position for the TV. It's got an incredibly large bathroom in it, like uh, shower wise. And it'll just have everything that we need. It's, 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 it's a very simple floor plan. It's a very simple travel trailer. It's kind of funny, Sean, that I own a motorhome and I'm now looking at a travel trailer and that you own a towable and that you're looking at motorized. But I will say that we are keeping our Class A motorhome. We'll still use that for traveling around in the United States. The towable, we will just place, we found a, a spot right on the beach down in Mexico for under $4,000 a year. So it's going to be you know, we won't be traveling with it, like towing it or anything like that. It's really just going to be like a vacation home in a sense. Very reasonable vacation home because it was selling at the Hershey show for like $16,000 for brand new towable. And like I said, we felt it was very nice. It had everything that we wanted. It had a large countertop for meal preps. Yeah, we think the price is right for sure. <laughs> yeah, and it would also just with that single axle, I mean, you don't have to worry about it's half the cost of tires from all that UV damage that they're going to get sitting on the beach. Yeah, I'm going to cover them up, but yeah, it's it's going to be tough since it's I'm not used to owning stuff that doesn't really, I want to say get used because we will go down there and use it a lot, but it's not going to move. Originally, we were thinking about purchasing, you know, our, our ideas changed often. We were thinking about maybe a small van at one time and we would drive it back and forth and then we're like, eh, 
it's a lot for, you know, the vans are expensive. We're not going to be using it that much to go back and forth. Then we start leaning towards the tow bowl. And then, you know, we went from a, a dual axle down to this single axle. Yeah. So I'm excited to get into the world of towables. I mean, it's very, it's similar, but it, it there's definitely a couple differences to it as well. You know, and uh, we'll be towing it down there with our motor home, which will be an experience too. I'm sure. <laughs> sure we'll get some looks down there <laughs> yeah and uh just for the record kenny we would not be keeping our towable <laughs> we would sell it if we okay got a motor. That's, yeah for okay sure. yeah. that's what that's what i was assuming but i wasn't 100 yeah. percent sure i didn't think you would guys you guys aren't trying to do what we're doing though where we're putting one in a different country <laughs> no <laughs> yeah that makes sense well you could do you know our, our next topic here is about outdoorsy you know you could always rent out the arctic fox if you wanted to uh outdoorsy just reported that three that they've had three billion dollars worth of transactions uh which is a lot. billion with a b <laughs> yeah. but but outdoorsy is also a lot larger of a company than i i didn't realize they were that big of a country of country <laughs> that big of a company yeah and they're projecting it they'll pass eight billion by 2029 so in just five years they'll pass eight billion yeah and they say that uh three billion is seven million nights outdoors by people from people renting which is a lot of nights as well yeah I, yeah they're in 11 countries which i guess helps you know get those numbers up there but sean and i were doing some calculating we estimate estimate that there are 34 million people renting an rv this year for 2024 uh to put that in like perspective there's about 12 million people that own so the rental market is three times the size of the owner's market which is I mean, really incredible. I wonder if those people rent. I'm, I'm sure a lot of them probably rent to buy. I mean, I guess you're kind of sort of doing that, right? I mean, you're renting an RV now to see if it would work for your travel. So I, I, I wonder if that that is the majority, do you think? Or do you think the majority is people that, you know, we just rent it whenever we need it. We're never really on purchase. We don't want the maintenance and That's what insurance. I think. You think it's the other way? Okay. Yeah. So you think it's just people renting for vacations, not renting to, for research to buy. However, Kenny, the one thing, and oh, first I want to say this article that, that we're referencing comes from Breaking Travel News, which I think is a European travel website, but they're, they're saying that Outdoorsy plans to expand into Europe. Um, so that that's one thing. But the one thing after doing this research, after Julie, not me, did the research on renting. The one thing that seems weird to me, and I I need to learn more about it, is that the insurance that they charge you for renting is so incredibly expensive compared to, like, we own our fifth wheel, and we pay, like, $90 a month for full coverage insurance on it. And like renting this small 24 foot motorized for five days, they there some companies, I don't remember exactly how it worked out, but some companies were charging as much as $360 for insurance. So I just don't understand how that works because you would think it would be comparable at least to what you're paying plus you have to pay like some of them you're paying three hundred dollars for insurance and then on top of that you're responsible for like a three thousand or two thousand dollar deductible yeah i think it was the deductible that really caught my attention i'm like wow that's a pretty so if, if you run into some type of issue and you have this insurance you're probably thinking all right well i got the insurance i'm covered i'm good and then they come back to you and say yeah, the insurance is on cover. <laughs> the damage, most of the damages, but you're still responsible for up to two to three thousand dollars. That's a lot of money out of pocket for what what was supposed to be you know, just a fun weekend trip. Now, of course, nobody's going out expecting to have a a issue or an accident, but that's you know that's you know it can happen. It can happen. And then if you got to 
put three grand out of pocket, I would not be a happy camper. <laughs> no, no, not for sure. But I, I mean, this article shows how huge the rental market is. So I guess people don't mind or they don't read. I don't know which which it is, but it's uh, I mean, three billion in transactions is a lot of money. <laughs> Yeah, I bet it's you. It's that they're not reading the fine print because I I think that would deter me today. When Sabrina and I did our rental, because we did the same thing that you're doing, we rented first. We rented a Class A to see if we'd like the Class A before we bought it. I do not remember having a large deductible like that. I don't even remember paying a lot. I mean, this was seven years ago, but I don't even remember really paying a lot in the insurance. I thought the insurance was very reasonable too. It was the only thing that seemed expensive to us was actually just the price of the rental. You know, seven years ago, the rent was like 300 and some bucks a, a night or something like that. I don't know what a class A motorhome would be now, but I don't remember a high insurance rate and I don't remember a deductible at all. If, if it was one, it had to be low. Sabrina reads, Sabrina loves to read. She loves to read small print. You know, she, she would have caught it just like Julie did, I think. Yeah, but good for good for outdoorsy. I'm glad I'm glad uh, they're doing well, and um, I'm glad the RV industry is doing well. I mean, this really is a positive for the outdoor industry. That's what I was going to say. I think this is great just for the for the industry, the market alone. Uh, the more RVers, the better. As long as we can keep up with the campgrounds. <laughs> And then uh, we got an article here, and I really only put this article in just to just to say that I did I had no idea that Prevost has been around for so long. I didn't know it was a a one hundred year old company. Did you, Sean? Did no, you know but I like the article for a different reason. But oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And I also I also didn't know it was a Canadian company. <laughs> Me neither. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. What What did you like about it then? I liked it because um, I found out about this motorcycle rv club called road hogs and it's pretty cool they limit it to like 80 coaches to be oh. members and um, you pay your dues annually and then you meet up it's kind of like a rally with a lot of motorcycle riding you know an rv rally and they go to cool places like they did the blue ridge parkway i read places like that like iconic motorcycle places and you meet up and take these rides and you have a lot of people riding with you. So you're not having to do it alone. It seems like a really cool club. Yeah. But you said they limit it. So you're on like a, must be on a waiting list. If somebody were to leave the group, then you can get bumped in or I wonder I'm how asking, they, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if you have to be um, vetted at any, at any point. I like, I wonder if members need to vote on who, who they allow in. It might be a very exclusive club. Might be, yeah, but they all had, well, in the photos I looked on their website, the photos, they had some nice RVs, so. Okay. Well, yeah. I, I was going to say, although we are talking about the Prevo crowd, which would be. Yeah. Exclusive anyway. Exclusive just to begin <laughs> with. I mean, you know, they were talking, to, they, they did a rally to, to celebrate the 100th anniversary, and they got a little bit over 160 Prevos to come together for this. And I was thinking. Uh, that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but we are talking about Prevos that are easily into the million dollar range of RVs and how many really could there be? I mean, I see them, but I don't think I see more than five a year when I'm traveling. I mean, it's an exclusive club for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought it was a cool concept, this road yeah. thing to have motorcycling and RVing. It's actually a perfect combination. It is. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, especially with the Prevo, they they have uh, one, I'm sure they could easily tow a trailer if you wanted to put your bikes in, or you could do like a, a tra um, you know, one of those hitches where you put the bike right on the hitch. Either way, the hitches that's on a Prevo would be able to handle towing or the weight down force of a, see, yeah. I'm not a towable person. What's, what's the downward force called again on a hitch? You know. I know usually, but I can't think of it right now. It's escaping me right now, Kenny. <laughs> it's escaping. Tongue me. weight, tongue weight, right? Tongue weight. Yep. That's yeah. It. Okay. <laughs> yep. Didn't mean to put you on the spot there. <laughs> yeah, and this article came from RV Business as well as the next article that we're going to talk about, um, which is something you're very familiar with. 
yeah, so I do a lot of work with Truma and I, and I, uh, but I didn't know this was coming out. They don't give me any like behind the scenes knowledge of anything. And I saw this article and I was like, oh, that's a really cool appliance that they're coming out with. It's, it's called the Combi, which has been around for a long time. Truma's had the Combi for a long time. But what's going to be new about this Combi system is it's going to work off of your gasoline tank that's already in your van. So you could ditch your propane. Well, I don't think this is going to be an aftermarket thing, I should say. This will be OEM coming right from, a, from the manufacturer. But the manufacturer will be able to remove the propane tank. And what I like about that is, one, it's just less sources for fuel and everything like that. It's, it's going to be more streamlined. That space can now be used for something else. But I, I feel it is, I wouldn't say it's difficult for, to get propane, but it's not as easy as getting just regular fuel just to fill up your tank. You can go, I mean, it's easy to get gas almost anywhere. But there have been a couple times that Sabrina and I have been out and we'll go to a place to get filled up with our motorhome especially, and that's what this would be for, this would be for motorhomes, when it's a fixed tank like that, you're kind of limited to who can fill that tank. And then on top of that, sometimes weather conditions can play a part of it. If it's too cold out, they won't always fill your tank. I've been to several places that have refused us to fill our fixed tank when the temperatures are in, uh, below freezing. And most people would say, well, most people don't RV when it's below freezing, but we do. Um, so I think just having that single source fuel for this, I, I think it's really cool. I, I'm, I'm excited to, to learn more about uh, the Combi. It's only called the Combi G, and they're looking to uh, market it for Class Bs and Class Cs. So, you know, it's like something that you're looking at, Sean. You know, the Vita, which is the, the small Class C, potentially you would be able to maybe purchase that without a propane tank. And just run off the uh, the fuel tank. Yeah, I guess my one question that I didn't see when I was looking at this was you have to balance, I guess, like efficiency in the fuel source yeah. versus yeah. the space. And I didn't really see what which was it more efficient as well, or is it less efficient? I I don't have any idea. And that would be one thing I would I would want to know, I guess. I bet you, I don't know either. I'm going to guess it probably, I could be wrong, but I'm going to say it's probably not because I, I've used the Combi that ran off the propane and I have a Truma AquaGo that runs off the propane. It's crazy efficient. Like, I couldn't imagine it being better than what they already have in the propane uh, department. So that's a really good point. I didn't think about that efficiency-wise, how much fuel it's using. I mean... We go all summer, like we fill up in, you know, June with our propane and it lasts us until fall. I'm, I'm, I'm still at over a half a tank of propane right now. So, yeah, that's a really good point. I guess the only thing that counterbalances that is just that it's going to be easy to refill with your gas tank and stuff like that. And your fuel tank is going to be much larger than a propane tank would be or, or anything like that. Yeah, that's a good question. I would, maybe... I do know people at Truma. Maybe we can get them to come on. Um, yeah. Could try to get Mark, the COO of uh, Truma, to come on, come on and talk about it. And he knows uh, the products very well. He would know efficient. I mean, he'll give us the efficiency numbers, everything. He'll go into detail with it. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to them and see if they would like to come on and talk about this Combi G. But, and yeah, that's I a think great I'm, all, I'm all about reducing fuel sources for sure. Yeah, and I know it's popular right now. I know Winnebago also tries to do uh, single fuel sources with like the Revel. I know they did it for a little bit with some of the Class A's. And I know from being in like the Facebook uh, groups and the forums and from working these shows, it's very hit or miss. Like some people, it's funny how how it's tough to build something that, for the masses, right? Like. You, depending on who you talk to, somebody's like, oh, I wouldn't, I, they, were, they would say, oh, I don't want to do anything that wouldn't have propane. I need my propane on there. I, I love the ease of swapping out tanks and bottles and stuff like that if it's not a fixed source. And then you talk to other people who are like, oh, I don't want an RV that has propane because I'm afraid of it, you know, afraid of propane. So it, it really just depends on who you talk to. Yeah, I wonder, though, if you could eliminate propane from RVs, would you reduce the amount of fires? Because there's a ton of fires. I know it's related. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. I don't know. I feel like 
are those fires usually I always feel like it it's with those refrigerators though the the RV fridges that are causing those propane fires but I don't know I bet you it's got to reduce the number it just yeah it would absolutely have to reduce the number yeah it's, that's another good question you know like I said I'll, I'll I'll reach out to Truman we'll try to get them on we're actually in the process of like talking to three or four different companies and trying to trying to get them on tell you what folks just behind the scenes stuff that's usually the most difficult I guess part of the the show is working with people's schedules and trying to get them, you know, I got a schedule, Sean's got a schedule, they got a schedule and <laughs> trying to work them all, work them all together. <laughs> Some good news in the EV space. Kenny found this article uh, from Thor Industries. They're coming out with a, is this a class C, right? That, class A. Oh, class A. Yeah, class A, it's small a, class A. With a 500 mile range, wow. Yeah, small class A, under 30 feet. I didn't see an, uh, like the exact dimensions of it, but yeah, under 30 feet. It's an EV. Mm, I don't know if I put that in quotes because it's, I would say it's an EV hybrid. So the powertrain is EV. It's an electric chassis. But what they're, use, what they're doing is they're using a gas-powered engine to charge the batteries that will then drive the RV. And I kind of relate that to like the diesel electric trains, I think work in a very similar uh, manner. But I think this is the way to go. I think this is a smart idea. I don't think the RV industry is ready for a true full on EV. And by being a hybrid and the way that this works to be able to give somebody a 500 mile range, I think is, a, you know, I think that alone is great. 500 miles in a single driving day is a lot especially for a class A motor home. It's, it's not the easiest vehicle to, to maneuver and handle. It is a high profile vehicle. So I think 500 mile range is great. And the fact that you can just kind of stop at a gas station, refill your tank. I don't know if you would automatically get another 500. I'm guessing you wouldn't because your batteries would be maybe on the low end. No, it shouldn't matter. Yeah, you should be able to fill your tank and then do another 500 miles. I'm also wondering, would they make it a, a dual charge in the sense that if i was at a campground plugged in would i be able to plug in and recharge those batteries while camping you know, so that you're not always using uh the gasoline fuel but now i'm thinking about it, i think you are always using the gasoline fuel I, I don't think there's ever a time that that i don't know for sure but i'm guessing that a gas engine is always running to power those batteries to drive so my guess is that they're able to use a smaller amount of batteries because it's just being constantly charged by the gas powered engine. <laughs> but they do say that it would qualify as a near zero emission vehicle. So yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I think once you have a gasoline powered anything in it, that's yeah, putting that's out. I'm wondering like how much is that gas engine actually actually going? running? Yeah. So maybe it's possible if you were doing a short distance, say maybe if you drove 50 miles somewhere, could it go 50 miles and not have to use the gas power? Could you just do all, all electric? Maybe it'll have different settings or features that you can shift it from all electric to hybrid to California yeah. mode, maybe. Yeah, maybe it would be California <laughs> mode. I mean, California is the one that's really pushing for all these tight, restrictions on emissions and stuff like that i mean they're banning generators they're banning small engines and like i believe side by sides and things like that so we were talking to somebody about this weren't we sure with uh california being uh really tough on restrictions i feel like we were at the fmca uh show when we were talking oh, to maybe. somebody about it and i can't remember maybe. now i'm drawing a blank that maybe was. one of the uh, chassis builders that we had on oh that's what it was might have been owning it, actually yeah yeah, so I, I think this is, to me, this is the step that makes sense. You know, go to a hybrid, something that would probably make more people more comfortable, remove that range anxiety, the fact that you can fill it up with gas and go further. I think it's a smart move. It does have solar uh, panels up on the roof. So if you were dry camping or boondocking, they're saying that you'd be able to put a charge back into those drive motors couple of things I didn't see. I don't know. Are the drive motors the same as your house batteries? Do you, are they separated? Like, do you have a, 
a dedicated house battery and dedicated drive motor, or is it all the same? Um, that would be things that we would be interested in learning more about also. And it's surprising me too that they're saying this is going to be available in 2025. Really soon. Much sooner than I would have expected. Which, which, so, you know, it's close enough. We, we should put predictions on what would a class A motorhome under 30 feet hybrid EV technology cost? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say 300,000. I'm going to go 325. <laughs> okay. I think it's going to be over 300. I really do. And I guess that's going to depend on amenities that are in it. But I can't imagine that they are going to put all this technology into this chassis and drivetrain and then skimp out on amenities inside the coach. I feel like this will just, I feel like this will be a high end coach. So I'm going to go 325, maybe three, maybe even higher than that. I want to say it's going to be over 325. MSRP. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too, MSRP. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to go 350. 350 MSRP. Oh, wow, you're going up, <laughs> huh? Although Thor Motorhomes, I think typically do end up on a lower end of MSRP. Uh, I don't think their Class A Motorhomes sell as high as other Class A Motorhomes. I'm, I'm sticking with the three. 325. 325 is my final answer. Okay. I, we, we would like to hear from you. Let us yeah. know. You know. Let us know down in the, the comments section. You can email us at Kenny at BeyondTheWheelPodcast.com or Sean at BeyondTheWheelPodcast.com. Let us know what do you think the price of this new EV is going to be. And I'm using the term EV loosely because I really feel like EV should be a true all-electric vehicle. I know they're calling it an EV, but I feel like once you put a gas engine in it, it becomes a hybrid and not not so much an EV. Yeah. I'm curious what Shakar thinks. Shakar will have an answer for us. Yeah. <laughs> he seems to be very analytical, so. Yeah. And uh, I I think this is something that, if I remember right, Shakar uh, had mentioned to me long, long ago, why, why isn't there a hybrid version of motorhomes? And my answer to that, my response to that, is because the motorhome companies rely on the chassis manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Most motorhomes and most uh, you know RV manufacturers are not building their own chassis. So even like this one, this is a partnership uh, with Har Harbinger. Is that how you would pronounce it? Harbinger, yeah. Har Harbinger Motors. So they are the ones building the chassis uh, for Thor, and then Thor's going to build the house on top of it. So. That's why, you know, if Ford had a all electric chassis for a class uh, for for a class C, then you know manufacturers like Thor and Winnebago would be able to build on it uh, very easily. But because they don't, then it's not easy for them to to build on it. So it's a couple extra steps for them to kind of work that out. Yeah, and then I guess since it's not a standard chassis, is maintenance going to be a problem? <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I don't even know who you would take that to. I mean, it's going to be not a one of a kind because it's going to be in regular production, but who would you bring that to when it comes time to some type of repair that's outside of just an, uh, an oil change on the gas motor? I don't even know if it's said, I didn't see anywhere, you know, what is the gas motor? Is Who's making the gas engine portion of it? Yeah, I didn't see that either. And I don't think I saw if it was gas or diesel, but I thought it said gas i think it said gas yeah. yeah i think i think if it was diesel they they they'd make it uh better well known that it was a diesel so i'm, I'm not gonna say it was gas yeah i think it'll be tricky for a little bit but somebody's got to do it somebody's got to you know start us off in that direction and i i think it's great yeah i think so too yeah i'm looking forward to seeing it and then we saw another good thing i'm at a campground right now and we're off season and it's a pretty it's pretty busy here today and uh, wholesale shipments uh, from RVBusiness.com is showing that uh, we're we're up 3.7 percent over August shipments from last year. So we're the 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 market is still growing, and I'm surprised about that every time. But it's growing in maybe not proportionately. So towable market is growing, but the motorized is shrinking. 
So it's really the towables that are picking up the slack. I think that's probably just because the interest interest rates have been so high, high and towables are much cheaper. Easier to get. Yeah. I mean, that towable yeah. that I was just looking at at the Hershey show, 15, 16,000, somewhere right around there, it's going to be a, a lot easier for somebody to get into something like that than... Geez, what do you think the cheapest motorized is? Can you find a, a 80 grand? It's probably the cheapest the motorized probably would fall 80, under. Yeah, that, that's my guess. 80. 70, 70 to 80 grand. Yeah, so I mean, that's a big difference between a 15 to a 7. And I'm, I bet you, you can find even a cheaper towable than 15 or 16. You know, you could go to like a uh, Coleman, I think, sells at the Hershey Show was selling for eight. I think I saw one for like eight grand. So that's pretty reasonable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it makes it makes it easy for it, somebody to get into it. The market is still growing. It's still growing. That's great. Yeah, I yeah. think that's I think that's super. And Kenny, before we uh, before we go on to where we're going to be, I just yeah. wanted to mention that I've been using that FMCA hotspot every time I travel, and I've had zero problems with it. I don't know if you've been using it or or how much you've been using it, but every time I travel, I use it and. I don't hardly even use my Verizon uh, hotspot in the RV anymore. I've just been using the the one from FMCA. So I do use it. I use it when I'm dry camping and boondocking mostly because it uses less power than my Verizon does. So I have a Verizon, I guess, box it's called. And I do like the Verizon box a lot. That's what I'm typically using when I'm at campgrounds or plugged in somewhere. If I'm boondocking or dry camping, I use the FMCA one and, it's, and it works great and it uses a lot less power, even though I have a lot of power. I'm always, you know, I'm trying to always be as, as efficient as possible. So I do like the FMCA hotspot that's running off the T-Mobile just for the fact that it does work great. I get great speeds out of it and the fact that it's uh, much more power friendly. Yeah. And I don't even know. FMCA is changing their name, so I don't know if they're oh, yeah. FMCA anymore or not, but their websites, you can still get to it from FMCA. So, um, But yeah, I'm really happy with that. I just wanted to let people know if they're thinking about getting that, I think it's the Insego T-Mobile hotspot from FMCA. It's, it's really good. Yeah, I like it a lot too. So now comes to the fun part. Another fun part. <laughs> Sean and I will both be at the Overland Expo East. Actually, I believe it's pronounced Overland East Expo. I always get it backwards. Uh, that's going to be in Arrington, Virginia. And that will be actually this coming weekend of when this is actually when this episode is being released. So oh, come okay. On. I was trying to do the math in my head. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> so definitely come out and check out the show. If you've never been to an Overland show, I feel like it's definitely an experience. If you're used to like typical RV shows, this is very different. I always compare it to, I feel like RV shows are very much uh, geared to people that are maybe not stationary, but you know, you're staying at campgrounds, you got hookups, you got sewer connections and stuff like that. It's very hard to find like water and sewer connections at an overland show because those guys mentality is, you know, I'm always on the go. I'm using cassette toilets to dump tanks and they're very much in motion and they're really about like all wheel drive and four by four and trying to get out as far as possible. So it's, it's a very different dynamic than like a typical RV show would be. Uh, we have happy hour every night. It's a, it's a good time. It's fun. <laughs> so if you're going to be in uh, Arrington, Virginia, uh, the weekend of Friday, the 4th, October the 4th, 5th and 6th, but Tron and I will both be there. So come definitely come by, look for us, shoot us a message, let us know if you're going to be there. That'd be the easiest way for us to be able to meet up with you. Well, I think that's it, Kenny, huh? I think so. Yeah. Another one in the books. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, we would really appreciate it if you could just leave us a rating or even type a review out on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on or a comment in YouTube if you're listening to the YouTube version. And uh, we really want to thank our sponsor, Battleborn Batteries. Like Kenny said, he wouldn't have been able to do his Route 66 trip without them. Um, definitely check them out. You can call them and actually talk to someone in the U.S. and and get all the information you need. And no pressure 
it seems like every time I call them, there's no sales pressure. It's just they want to help you think about the things that you need to think about when you're thinking about going to lithium batteries and any type of solar project or anything like that. So definitely check out Battleborn Batteries. The link will be in the show notes. And uh, until next time, everybody, safe travels. Looking to get out there and stay out there? Battleborn Batteries lithium ion batteries are here to power your RV, marine, and off-grid adventures. Designed as an easy drop-in replacement for traditional lead-acid batteries, these reliable solutions have two to three times the power, charge five times faster, are a fifth of the weight, and last 10 times longer. Offered in a variety of models in unique sizes and shapes, ranging from 50 amp hour to a robust 270 amp hour, and backed by a 10-year warranty. Battleborn batteries are built to fit your needs and power your experiences. On the road, on the water, and off the grid, reliable power is here. Check them out at battlebornbatteries.com.